Now, it's called the cutting season, where Maasai villages in Kenya line up young girls under the belief that unless they don't undergo female genital mutilation, they will not become women. However, one little girl decided that was not going to be her fate. Not only did she run away, but Nice Nayalente Lengete went on to help some 15,000 girls to escape the same fate and the child marriage that inevitably followed soon after. She was declared by Time magazine as one of the most influential people in 2018 and joins me in the studio today. Nice, thank you for coming in. Thank you for having me. To stand up and say no at the age of eight is an extraordinary thing to do. What gave you the strength to do that? I think what gave me the strength is because of the pain I've seen uh, girls from my village, my friends and family members undergoing because from the age of six, I used to attend other ceremonies and seeing my friends going uh, circumcision. So I saw death in this community. I saw girls as young as 10 after their circumcision because they are now considered women becoming child brides. So it's not something that I read on book, but it's an experience I saw in my community. And I knew the only way I'll have a chance to go back to school is when I don't agree to undergo the cut. And that's why uh, I had to escape two times. It was not easy. And uh, my sister had to sacrifice herself so that I'd be left out. So that is why really I decided I'll not do any other job, but just to come back to my community and find a solution that is sustainable because running away is not a solution. Now, one key person who saved you is your grandfather. Yes. And the very important thing about all of that is getting male elders of the village mm -hmm. on side. Mm -hmm. So how hard has that been since then to in your campaign to end FGM to reach out to these men and say this is not the thing to do, it is not right? Uh, it's not easy to change men because why circumcision is done for girls is the rite of passage from girlhood to womanhood. It's what makes you a woman. So that means after your circumcision, you're ready for marriage. If you look at the Maasai culture, we have so much that is really good. In, you know, the way we dress, our beautiful dances, the way we live together, love one another. That's a good culture that we need to promote. So the only thing that is wrong in our culture or when we have circumcision ceremonies is the cut. So how can we replace the cut with education, but morally give out sexual education? So how do you do that? Uh, so what we've been able to do is that we have different forums whereby we talk to me both men, women, girls and boys differently, and then later we bring them together. When we are talking to them, remember, we use a human rights-based approach. We look at it as a gender issue. We look at it by having community structured dialogues whereby we talk on issues on sexual and reproductive health and rights issues. It's also about education, which is very important uh, in our work. And by having those forums, we have a training for girls for one week, whereby they are taught on all sexual and reproductive health and rights issues. And then on the last day, cultural leaders are there to bless them. This time round, not to go and give birth or take care of their husbands, but to bless them with books and pens to be important people in the society, to be teachers, to be professors, journalists, or anything they want to become in future. And what is the response of those villages that you go into and convince them to hold these alternative rites of passage? You know, how does the whole process affect them individually as well? Uh, remember, when you're trying to change culture, it's not easy. Patience is really key in this work because, again, it's about changing behaviour. It's about changing mindset. It's a whole process. So uh, what we are really trying to do is to empower these women also. Economic empowerment is really important in this work. Remember, to the old women, they are paid to circumcise girls. So that's a job for them. So as much as we are giving them uh, information on health consequences about FG, but how are we also able to start small income generating activities for them so that if they stop, they have other alternative, you know, or ways they can make their income and all that. Now, rates of uh, female genital cutting worldwide have fallen, I think, by about 14% yeah. in the last 30 years. Yeah. And in Kenya, mm -hmm. cases have fallen more than twice that fast. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's going to come a time when eventually the whole practice has been eliminated? Um, I would say much has been done right now. We, you know, the movement is not so fast, but at least there is progress that is happening. But I think 
now this is not an African problem. This is a global problem. Even here in Europe, FGM is still a problem. So I think what we should do is now try and come up together, like-minded organization, to empower these community members to be able to make their own solutions. So what should be done is to empower these community members and also try and find a global solution so that we can fasten our movement. Because I think by us coming together, sharing our different ideas, putting good policies that are very friendly to women and girls, also translating these laws to local languages. I think that is the only way we can make sure that uh, we can bring female genital mutilation to an end. Nice. It's been great speaking to you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you too.